Barnaby Brockett, Chapter 4, The Best Day of Barnaby's Life So Far. So, St Aloysius is the obvious choice, said Eleanor, the evening she and Alistair were deciding what to do about Barnaby's education. It's only down the road, after all. I'm not sending him there, said Alistair. Most of our neighbours send their sons to that school. Everyone in Kirribilli will be talking about us. And what if it gets back to bother and blast it? People might look at me funnily. Well, where do you suggest then? asked Eleanor. What's the name of that school on Lavender Bay? It's a little further away, but... Absolutely not, said Eleanor, looking at her husband as if he had mo no more sense than a rabbit. Jane Macquarie Hammond across the street sent her little Duncan there. What would she say? Well, I don't know what choices we have, replied Alistair with a sigh. We could always keep him at home, I suppose. Does he really need an education after all? Oh, of course he does, said Eleanor, scrolling through a list of Sydney schools on the internet until she found one that satisfied her needs. We can't add ignorance and stupidity to his other failings. Now look, here we are, she added triumphantly, spinning the laptop round to show her husband the gravelling academy for unwanted children. It's almost as if it was built with Barnaby in mind, said Alistair, examining the school's website, which made a great deal of the fact that it had been set up by former governor of Dilwinia Women's Prison to educate those children who, for one reason or another, had been rejected by the regular school system. Shall I make an appointment? It couldn't do any harm to visit. Anyway, it looks rather nice, doesn't it? He added, clicking through the photos on the computer screen. All that barbed wire on top of the walls is probably there as part of a project to teach the children about prisoner of war camps. And the look of the building itself, said Eleanor. It's like one of those workhouses out of Oliver Twist. The children must love it. They certainly must, agreed Alistair. And so three days later, they found themselves sitting in front of Harriet Hooperman Hall the school principal. Is that, it's not that he's not an intelligent little boy, said Alistair. He's actually very bright, said Eleanor. He reads the most extraordinary books. He prefers authors who are dead, she added, laughing a little as if she had never heard of such an extraordinary thing. And he's never been any, in any trouble, said Alistair. But we do feel that Barnaby would benefit from some, how shall I put this, special attention. Mrs Hooperman Hall smiled and stroked her whiskers. She looked a little like a female goat, although her two front teeth resembled those of a dromedary. Before speaking, she ran her tongue along her thick, gloopy layer of dark red lipstick that stuck to the edges of her mouth like mortar to a brick, and snaked it in and out in a rather disgusting fashion. Alistair and Eleanor, she said, or may I call you Mr and Mrs Brockett? We at the Gravelling Academy have long suffered from a misunderstanding that our students are more difficult than those in other schools. Yes, it's true that some of our pupils have been in and out of young offenders' institutions since before they could walk. And yes, it's an unfortunate fact that we have security cameras in every classroom and metal detectors over every door. And no, we don't go in for any of that modern mumbo-jumbo that requires all our teachers to be board certified, whatever that means. I've never actually understood that term, have you? Well, I think it means... But despite all these things, we pride ourselves on the fact that we open our doors at eight o'clock every morning and padlock them shut again every afternoon at three. And while nothing, of the ver uh, while nothing very much happens in the eight hours in between. I think that's seven hours, actually, said Alistair, who had always been good with numbers. While nothing of very much use happens in the eight hours in between, insisted Mrs Hooperman Hall, we do at least keep the children out of your way, which, let's face it, is what you're looking for. We embrace difference here, she added in a magnanimous tone. So your little Barnaby floats. What matter? We have a child of six who hops like a kangaroo. Another who held up an off licence in an armed robbery and refuses to say where she stashed the loot. A third who speaks French fluently. But do we hold any of these things against them? No, we do not. Which was good enough for Alistair and Eleanor. And shortly after this, they left the school, trying not to notice how the wallpaper was peeling off the walls. The carpets were covered in cigarette burns and the overflowing waste paper baskets next to them were quite clearly a fire hazard. Having had little contact with the other children during his short life, except for Henry and Melanie, of course, Barnaby was understandably nervous during his first week at the Gravelling Academy for Unwanted Children. Fortunately for him, however, he was placed next to another new boy, Liam McGonagall, whose great-great-great-grandfather had been one of the first convicts to be shipped to Australia from Britain during the 1800s having already been exported from Ireland for taking a pee on a statue of King George the Fourth, 
Like Barnaby, Liam found the idea of spending the day with a classroom full of children he'd never met before intimidating. He too had failed to make friends, having been born with an unfortunate medical abnormality. His arms came to an end at his wrists and he had two neat sets of steel hooks where his hands should have been. These terrified most of the other children in the class, but didn't bother Barnaby in the slightest. In fact, he would have made a point of shaking Liam's right hook on the first morning they met and every morning afterwards. Only this was impossible, for Mrs Hooperman Hall always collected him at the front door and brought him directly to his seat, tying him to his chair with a strong rope and a series of complicated knots. Was it an accident? He asked Liam when they became friendly enough to ask personal questions, which was only a few hours later. The loss of your hands, I mean. No, I was born like this, said Liam. It was just one of those things. Some people have no brain, like Dennis Lichten over there. He no nodded towards a taller than average boy who was engaged in a conversation with his shoes. Some have no sense.